Welcome to The Shooting Show. This week, Southern Foxer Gary Green has a change of scenery and heads to the Orkneys on a wild goose chase. Plus we take you behind the scenes of The Shooting Show with our favourite cameraman. You don't get much daylight in Orkney at this time of year, but it takes more than a bit of darkness to stop Gary Green. He's headed off to the north coast for several days while fouling with Black Islander Sporting. We head out to a likely location on some farmland a short way from the sea, getting in position just before dawn. Our guide, Magnus, sets out the plan of attack. Well, here we are at last after a 17 hour journey in Orkney at St Margaret's Hope with Magnus Norkwood. Nork Wire, sorry about <laughs> that. And uh, it's a bit fresh out there to say the least you can see. The most interesting for me is um, when did you first start shooting? Obviously you've been here all your life. Probably start shooting with my father when I was probably seven, eight year old, you know. Uh huh. Can I? And when did you actually first shoot your first geese? Geese was kind of later on, so we were mainly shooting ducks because there was very few geese. You know, like if you got a goose, it was quite a novelty to see a goose, never mind shoot one. But in all this, you'd be following geese about, hoping they landed. Kind of right. See them three or four fields off, you'd make your way down the ditch, crawl, just do whatever you had to to get in range to get shot the goose. I think they're talking about 30,000 birds or something. Right, so you've got 30,000 resident geese. Yeah, well, I don't know what that'll be next year if they're all of them five or six each. Like yeah. each pair, you know. And there's nothing done with that? Uh, They've no got a call going. They have? They do have a call going, you know, but... I don't know if it's a success or not. Mm. They mess up the fields. Like, they leave a lot of mess. They, yeah. they platter the field up and pull the grass up by the roots. And okay. Really, I, I think a lot of farmers believe that like, the animals don't like eating the grass after the geese either. Um, well, just now, like, the geese is all sprayed out yeah. because of the shooting. They're getting shot a lot. The east end of the island, there's some boys that are locally shooting that heavy. So, I mean, they push the geese out here, and then when they get shot a bit more here, they'll push them back. And okay. You've got other ones that are shooting up west a lot, and they're yeah. pushing. The geese is just moving around until they get a bit of peace for a wee while, you know. Yeah. And a bit like the wood pigeon shooting, yeah. similar sort of thing. I mean, yeah. you'll get the highlights here for a few weeks, and then they'll go quiet. Till you find them, till they get back or yeah, just keep them moving, you know. And you get some good bags on the geese here with your clients. Can do, yeah. Yeah, what sort of bags can you get? You? Just depends. I mean, a lot of clients only wanting two or three birds a morning, so okay, they shoot with that. They can stop early, or mm -hmm. you get some farms that's wanting them shot off because it's like local geese, so you can shoot anything up to bag a hundred or more or right. some mornings, right conditions. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it's there, the sport's there. Oh, it's there, and all the right. And yeah. the pest control side of it's there as well, in amongst that. Yeah. You could you could shoot geese seven days a week here, mm. or six days a week. Yeah, I can appreciate Sunday that. Sunday off. Yeah. But, I mean, you get tired of shooting geese, but it's good taking folk who was no shot geese. Yeah. And they get a big bag of geese, and they're just over the moon, you know, there's nothing yeah. better than that. Yeah, That's so actually better than shooting geese for silks. Yeah, I can relate to that with the pigeon shooting that I've done over the past. It's nice to give people days that have never had a good day. I've only ever shot Canada's because we're swarmed of them down home. And I've had some good days on them myself, but that's all daytime shooting. That's, and that's all sort of nice and comfortable in a hide behind a bow and none of this um, laying down on the floor of all these sort of temperatures and changes of weather. But no, it's certainly a good challenge. I'm enjoying that. But it's, uh, it's a whole new swerve on it for me, as I say, the whole thing, the surroundings, the company, you know, um, me learning rather than teaching as well, which is quite interesting. I enjoy coaching stuff and that and showing people how to lay decoys out, but no, it's, it's a lot of good tips I've picked up this morning. 
That's so just the waiting game, you know, you kind of suss. Try and find the geese first, get set up, and hopefully they'll come on back to the same field, but sometimes it works better than other times, you know, like. Yeah, we had some literally first light, didn't we? As soon as the light started lifting, they was, they was there as we were mm -hmm. setting up. Yeah, I think a few geese were sat in our debris at the rise of the field yeah. when we got there, because they were lifting. Again, because it was such a still night last night. Yeah. Like, if you get a still night, they'll sit, they'll just sit down, you know, if there's a bit of clear sky, they'll, let, they'll lay in the field. Mm -hmm. Just because of the shooting pressure, they're changing their habits a little bit, so... You can, they'll feed through the night in a full moon, they'll never come off the fields in the moon. I notice you, you keep them all in pillowcases, what's your main reason for doing that? That's just mainly to help the lifespan of the decoy and save yeah. me having to clean them as well. Yeah, yeah, what, and stop them rubbing together yeah. and stopping the, the sort of flock getting yeah. rubbed off. Yeah. And I remember you saying about the white on those geese, that it's very important to keep that clean. Yeah, well I think, like if your decoy's turning into the wind anyway, yeah. you know your geese when they're approaching, seeing the back ends of your yeah. decoys mostly and it's a white. Identification mark, a bit like wood pigeon shooting really, with the sort of white bars on the wings. Yeah, well if you look at any flock of geese, the first thing you spot them by is their white tails. It's and the flashes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good comparison that, but it's a good tip with the, the old um, pillar case is what you're doing. Well, laying in the um, hides, interesting. I'm afraid I think I've spoiled myself with a fox box. There's no central eating or cups of tea out there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, you'll get four seasons in one day here, no bother. Yeah, yeah, I felt that today. day. Yeah, mate. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's soft southern, boys. <laughs> that was cold today because, like, this is where first with that sleety weather which just knocks temperature down when you get that kind of wind chill when you get wet you feel it more anyway yeah that kind of put the geese off a bit today too like the geese yeah. they look like they're gonna come at the start and then mm. when we get that hilly shore to just stop dead yeah they just settle halfway or whatever suits them and stay there then you know yeah that, shooting them in that position that you sit into is quite weird at first but you soon sort of settle into that especially oh, yeah. those semi-autos because they're quite forgiving in the shoulder so you're not yeah. suffering a load of recoil they're quite quick as well to swing them up. yeah yeah no out in the field the boys lie in wait in their decoy coffins magnus has done this a hundred times before but gary seems a little nervous this is a far cry from his heated fox box what we desperately need is an early flight to ease his apprehension With the deeks out and the guns well camouflaged in their coffins, the situation looks promising. Orkney is famed as a goose shooting destination, but we're anxious to see the first action of the morning. This is a long way to travel to strike out. Finally, we get our first taste of goose shooting Orkney style. Yeah, it's sort of a surprise for everyone, I think, when you all come bursting out of the ground like that. No. <laughs> That's good fun. Mm, yeah. I enjoyed it. You should just forget the body of the goose when you're shooting. Just just look at it like the head, like a teal or someone, and just pull a head and try and get a pellet in the head or an egg. That's the thing too, a lot of wind if you're a goose, you might look like he's stopped. Yeah. But you still have to give them the same lead of no more because you've got the windage. Yeah, that's a, a thing that a lot of people don't pick up. Yeah, the thing, the goose is standing still with fire straight at it. Yeah, because it's a big bird, they think it's slow, but it's actually one of the faster birds, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and the shooting position I thought was going to be really difficult, but actually it was quite comfortable. Weird, but once I got the first few shots off, I hit the first one, killed that and missed the second one with both barrels, what I'd left. But um, no, it was, yeah, I sort of propped up into it quite easy. I didn't have to think about it too much. You're sort of in a sort of a, a set up position at the back, and you've got like this gauze that you're looking through with the doors that you close. We never thought Gary was one to lie down on the job, but he seems to be doing rather well from that position. Another skein comes into range and Gary manages to pick out a bird. And actually, yeah, you're sort of communicating with Magnus and, and Liam and it's sort of, they're keeping you in touch with what's going on. I was in the middle of these two guys and yeah, it was just no problem at all. You can have a little sort of look left, right and out in front of you and you can see what's coming in, even if it's three foot off the ground at that point.
It's time to retrieve the shot geese and for Gary to get some fresh air. And it certainly is fresh. The gale makes it hard to have a conversation, let alone shoot. This isn't the biggest bag in the world, but as shooting experience goes, it's been hard to beat. Plus, we can already start looking forward to the evening flight. What do we? We had a few, didn't we? But what? What? Um, what amount? If they was coming in, what, we, could we have shot a sort of really big bag there? Do you reckon? It wasn't, the f it wasn't the field we were going to get a big bag off of, it was just a kind of field that the geese were steady going to, you know? Yeah. But, um, we'll try it again and see yeah. if we get a big yeah, bag in next time. I mean, we didn't get a big bag of geese today, but it's a good night for night shooting. And, mm -hmm. and Night shooting is what we used to do most of, you know, we never did too much morning shooting because there was never a bunk of geese, you know. Ah. So kind of night shooting is what we like, you know, and it's fine to slip off the small pond and get a good bag of birds. You know? So I'm going to be under pressure tonight then to see if I can shoot a few in the dark, literally, yeah, with oh, you yeah. guys. That's what sorts, <laughs> that's what sorts of boys who come up for doing the road. <laughs> We head back to base to prepare for the next Orkney wildfowling experience. By then, perhaps the birds will be coming in more readily, and perhaps Gary will have adjusted himself to the Scottish weather. He is a southerner after all. Either way, we'll follow the next flight soon on The Shooting Show. Well, that's Gary's goose chase done, and now, The Shooting Show news. This is the Shooting Show News. Sporting Rifle Magazine's auction for Save the Rhino has now raised over £10,000. The auction, taking place in the magazine and online, raises crucial funds for anti-poaching efforts in Mkuzi Reserve, South Africa, and Big Game Parks, Swaziland. This is the third time the auction has taken place. Altogether, it has raised over £25,000. There is still time to place your bid. Check out all the lots in Sporting Rifle Magazine. Shooters have been warned about the RSPB's continuing attack on grouse moor owners and their managers. Countryside Alliance Executive Chairman Barney White Spunner said the RSPB's latest bird crime report made a number of serious accusations against grouse moor managers without any firm evidence. He said it was the latest in a long line of reports that seek to demonise and undermine gamekeepers and the shooting community. Shooting show presenter Pete Carr has described himself as humbled after he won the Zeiss Journalist of the Year award. Citing Sporting Rifle Magazine's conservation work as the main reason, the judges picked him from a field of 42 international hunting journalists spanning four continents. Pete said it was the first time in his life he had been lost for words. There's a new wave of entry discounts at the next Clay Shooting Classic. In a bid to encourage grassroots participation, the Clay Shooting Company has announced that pots under 14 will receive an extra discount to their entry, bringing it down to £60. The Classic will take place at Windrush Shooting Ground on the 4th to the 7th of June. To enter, head to the Clay Shooting Company website or pick up a copy of Clay Shooting. And finally, Modern Gamekeeping has kicked off a fundraising auction for the Gamekeeper's Welfare Trust. Among the lots on offer are two trophy Robux with the Modern Gamekeeping editor, a wild goat stalk in Russia, a 500 bird day on the Rothwell estate and a weekend's driven boar shooting in Bavaria for two guns. Read the full list of lots in Modern Gamekeeping and email your bids to the address on screen now. That was the Shooting Show News. As it's the end of the year, we thought we'd bring you something a little special. So we've got all the Shooting Show cameramen together to give their outlook on what it's like to work on the Shooting Show. Me, I'm normally the guy pulling the trigger. but sometimes even I have to swap rifle for camera. My debut behind the camera involved breaking one of my own personal golden rules, and that's always to have a rifle with you on a dangerous game hunt. I followed Bedfordshire gamekeeper and good friend Paul Childerley on a buffalo hunt. But thankfully, under the direction of PH Patrick De Beer, we managed to catch the whole damn thing on camera, despite the best efforts of the African bush. Without a doubt, all the cameramen agree, it's a lot harder to film birds than mammals. With that in mind, I decided to try and have something of an edge, and went for an ostrich. It may be 150 times the size of a pheasant, but it still managed to fall off camera. 
I got a phone call from Pete saying, um, how do you feel about taking a camera out into the field? And I was a little bit apprehensive, obviously I'd never done any filming before. Um, I've only ever done very limited stills photography before as well. But um, it went really well. It was, I went rabbiting with Matt Manning and he was very, very helpful. Um, really made it quite an easy thing to get started on. From sunny Somerset all the way up to Scottish Highlands, Glen Etiv, which was your next filming expedition. That must have been quite different. Was it a shock? It was very much a shock, yes. I'd never been to Scottish Highlands before. Um, coming from a desk job to being hauled up a peak that's only 25 feet short of being officially classed as a Munro on my first day in Scotland, with camera and tripod in tow, was possibly the most physically demanding thing I've ever had to do. It's quite difficult to keep your balance up there when you've only got one hand to, to sort of balance and hold on with. But we got some we got some footage, so it wasn't a completely completely wasted trip, so that was good. The gun I was with did manage to get a shot off. Um, unfortunately the time we're gonna take him flight just as he was preparing to shoot. Um, missed the shot, but I also missed that shot. Um, as he swung through I'd slipped, hit the off button on the camera and um, unfortunately that was the end of end of that scene. Probably learned a few lessons doing that though, I imagine. Yes. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> and as if the peaks around Glen Etive were not high enough, you were then taken to Austria, filming in the Alps. How, yeah. how high was that? It was pretty high. I mean, we were already um, in the Tyrol region. Even at village level, we were very high above sea level. We went a further three and a half thousand feet on top of that. And it was so high that when we actually went up the second day and shot the chamois, um, I actually got a nosebleed from the altitude. It was quite difficult because um, we were filming up the slope from down the slope. So the camera was on a very, very steep angle. I was behind the camera. Um, Pete was really, really helpful with that. Um, he helped me get the camera set up and made sure that I was focused on the chamois before he got the rifle ready. Um, it was just grazing, so it wasn't going anywhere very fast, but as he prepared to take the shot, he turned around and gave me a thumbs up to ask if I was all right with the camera. Saw I was having the nosebleed, did a double take, turned back around and then shot the chamois, came back, did the congratulations, then came over and asked if I was okay. <laughs> so priorities in order. Yes, yes, absolutely. Kill shot comes first. Doesn't do. We we did have a couple of hairy moments. Um, the first was when we went up after that time again. When we'd got to the back of the peak and still hadn't found any further signs of time again, Pete decided to take the other gun further down on the loose scree, and um, it, they were a little bit apprehensive. But Pete went, "Oh, you'll be all right." Yes, I missed the only time again all day here. <laughs> We've walked up and down nine thousand feet. Nearly killed the host. Exactly. No, that's not the sort How of thing. How did you nearly I... kill the host? I'm making me walk across all that bloody scree. Yeah, I want to do it. <laughs> I'm told he did make it back though. He did. He made it back alive and in one piece, which he was very happy about. <laughs> How was that? I'm alive. <laughs> yeah. no, I think... a, a couple of uh, a couple of amusing moments, or amusing now, possibly more horrific at the time. <laughs> that you like to tell us about? Um, after we'd gone and filmed the grouse day at Farndale, um, it had chucked it down solidly all day. Everybody was absolutely wet through. Um, we came back, I got the camera equipment dried out as best I could, and then Pete sent me a message to let me know that we were ready to do the pieces to camera. So I took the camera down and couldn't find them in the library, couldn't find them in the dining room. Um, I asked another member of the shooting party who told me they were in the, in the spa. I found them in the hot tub and <laughs> Pete sent me to go and get a round of pims and lemonade and they were going to do the pieces to camera in the hot tub with the pims but it took an hour to get a series of pieces to camera that Pete was happy with. Um, I was kneeling on the raised side of the hot tub so I had cramp in my feet and the backs of my legs. My arms were aching from holding this boom mic over the, the hot tub obviously because the noise of the engine was getting into the camera mic. Um, so after an hour of that we'd finally got some pieces to camera Pete was happy with and then he decided not to use the footage at all. So it was a 
all that pain. There's, there's For very little gain, yes. Yeah. Why are you out of shot? Because he's back in. Oh, oh, Everybody happy? A, a summing up then of of how it's been 2013 in film. Yeah, it's been a it's been a lot to take in, but everybody I've been with's been really really nice. Um, they've explained everything to me. They've forgiven me when I've made mistakes, and it's uh, it's generally been a really positive experience. Bring on 2014. Quite. Coming to the end of the year, we thought we would take a look back at some of the most memorable kill shots. And when you're hunting and filming at the same time, it brings with it a unique challenge that everything is twice the amount of effort. Not only do you have to get the person with the rifle or shotgun into the right position and pull off a, a shot that's successful, you have to do exactly the same with the camera, and the camera has to be rolling when that shot goes off. And it doesn't always go right. The first was hunting bush pigs in South Africa, and I knew that this was going to be a challenge. I'd done a bit of bush pig hunting before with dogs, it's an incredibly difficult task. So I knew that we weren't going to be able to take the standard camera in um, that we do most of the filming with on the shooting show. This was going to have to be filmed with a GoPro. Now we could get away with it in this circumstance because the pigs are normally very, very close uh, when eventually you get in to take the shot. But unfortunately, because I'd been pushing my way um, th uh, through a lot of thick bushes and it was early in the morning, there was a lot of dew um, on the bushes and I had a bit of water on my lens and as I came up through the last bush uh, where the, the, the hounds had bathed the pig some sunlight just came through the trees um, opposite me and obscured uh, the, the lens in a way that you couldn't really see what was happening. It was so disappointing. Everything else had gone absolutely perfect uh, and it would have been the most marvellous kill shot to get if it had been a clean piece of film. One of the highlights of my year was heading over to the west coast with my mate Eden to try and shoot foxes during the day and at night. Now our daytime activity couldn't have gone much better. In the last 20 minutes of light we were notified of a fox's presence by some crows making an awful racket in the corner of a wood. And sure enough, just as we expected, uh, a little cub came bumbling down the fence line and walked straight towards us. Uh, we got ourselves in a nice comfortable position lying down prone and Eden pulled off a perfect shot um, nailing the fox where it stood just beside um, a gate post. Trying to film bird shooting with a shotgun is a completely different kettle of fish. With bird shooting everything's a lot faster and a lot more instinctive, a bit like the actual shooting itself. If you're trying to film a rough day like I've done with David Virtue this year that has to be the most challenging of all because you just do not know where the birds are going to get up or what direction they're going to fly in. Now there are two bird shooting um, instances from last season that really stand out for me. Now the first was with Pete Carr. Uh, we were filming a, a duck flight down in Yorkshire and everything just came together nicely. We knew where the ducks were going to be coming from because of the, the wind behind us and they were going to be coming into the wind. The light levels were just right. Filming duck flighting is incredibly difficult because not only is it a wild bird, you don't know exactly when it's going to arrive, but the light levels um, are failing. And to get the ducks in, in that very, very small window, is a challenge in itself. And then capturing those kill shots on film is definitely a bit of luck involved as well as some skill. It's very difficult for me to pick out a single kill shot, but I have to say that morning goose flights really are at the top of my list of experiences Although you get plenty of lead time as you're watching the skiing come in, what you have to be careful about is showing yourself too soon. The last thing you want to do is be responsible for the skiing flaring away before anyone else has had a chance to take a shot. You're probably going to be the last one on your feet, and uh, for that reason, it's definitely worthy of mentioning uh, for the top kill shots of the year. One of my most satisfying mornings filming was with Nick Latus last year in the early part of the Roebuck season. I couldn't have asked for better conditions. We managed to bag two kill shots with two Roebucks on film, including an excellent bit of uh, blood tracking through a thick bit of forest. I couldn't have put this list together without mentioning one of the shooting show's most successful films to date. About this time last year, I was over in Germany filming a driven boar hunt. But it wasn't the kill shot I captured uh, during the drive itself that is most memorable. It is the follow-up 
after the drive of a wounded boar where I managed to capture both the shooter and the boar at the same time and the end result made that quite a spectacular piece of footage which I'm sure most people who watch the shooting show have already seen. Next time you're enjoying the shooting show, spare a thought for the cameraman because if you're watching the shooters trudging up a hill or sitting in a frozen ditch, well, you can guarantee the cameraman's there too, trying to keep the lens clean and hold the camera still. Sometimes that's more of a challenge than others, like this outing after geese on Orkney. Wind chill, on it. <laughs> it's pretty hard, Dieter. Still, if you wear the right clothing and take a nice flask of tea, you can be comfortable, even if you do look a bit strange. But usually, conditions aren't that bad, and uh, hey, how hard can it be? You just follow along behind the shooters, point the camera, and um, away you go. So I thought. I'll give the camera to somebody else, do the shooting myself. Oh, I missed it all, because I put the camera down as I was watching. Sorry. Well, that didn't work, but I had a cunning plan. I'd put one of these cameras on my cap, so I thought, that'll catch all the action. Well, it did. It caught me missing with both barrels. Never mind. Another few hours walking and here's another brace of grass. I can't believe I f***ing missed both of those. Oh dear. Of course, when the shooter does hit the quarry, you do need to be pointing the camera in the right direction. Here's me out with Robert Bucknell after a fox. Now things always seem to go wrong when I'm out with Robert. Here he is, shining his lamp about and giving him a little squeak now and again. And then this varmint appears. Well, not much point carrying on here. Let's move on somewhere else. Here's one. That's more like it. Here's one. Robert gets on the back of the truck and starts calling. I'm behind him, trying to find where the fox is, and he's pointing to the right, so that's where it must be. No, apparently not. What he meant was, you better move round to the right, or you won't be able to see the fox, because it's coming up the ditch. Well, eventually, this fox gets so close, that he has to shoot, or he's going to be firing through his bonnet. See, I couldn't, couldn't let it get much closer, because it was bang in line. I thought, well, if you keep coming across here, oh, yeah. I won't be able to see you anymore. If you'd come up the bank, you'd have both have found it, but I couldn't uh, risk it um, and get the fox. Yeah. One of the, the, the joys of, of um, trying to get everything in the, in the lens and in the front of the scope as well. Oh, well, <laughs> missed that one then. Robert seems happy, though. I don't seem to be struck this year. No, nothing there. Sometimes it all seems to go smoothly despite everything. Here I am out with Gary Green, we've been up a high seat for a couple of hours and he's just shot a nice munchak buck. And we fetched it back and I'm thinking, well I better get some shots in from the outside of the high seat, showing him looking out. So I get him back in the high seat and I climb up the outside and I'm busy filming away and suddenly he's trying to tell me something. What's that? It's another munchak. Oh, another munchak, yeah, very funny Gary, come on, come on. What? Yeah. Okay, so there's another muntjac there. Now I'm clinging on the front of the high seat. I've got to try and spin round, catch it in the viewfinder, and film it without falling off and breaking my neck. Well, somehow, we made it. He's going to go. Got it? Got it. Gary made the shot, muntjac went down, job done. Brilliant. <laughs> That's amazing. So don't feel too sorry for the cameraman. He's probably enjoying himself. It's always a challenge, always an adventure, and it certainly beats sitting at a desk nine to five. 
Well, that's it for this year. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. This has been The Shooting Show.